Thank you. Um, may I just uh, quickly uh, sum up a few points that I wish to make? Uh, I'm looking at um, Molana Azad uh, as a political educator uh, of the nation. And uh, this role of the Molana starts with his uh, starts at the beginning of the century of the 20th century really uh, with his role as a journalist and uh, even before he sets up uh, al hilal and al balag later his earlier association with various journals uh, by the time he sets up al hilal he is creating a, a revolution virtually within uh, within the uh, Muslim community about what their relationship to the politics of the larger Indian nation ought to be. And uh, his writings were so influential that they, even Maulana Muhammad Ali and a number of other leaders of the time uh, were influenced uh, by them. And uh, he was interned, you know, as, as everybody knows, in Ranchi in 1916, and that internment lasted till 1919. But his influence uh, on the Muslim mind was so great that uh, <clears throat> his biographer, V. N. Datta, uh, writes that uh, even the pact between the Muslim League and the Congress uh, in 1916 uh, at Lucknow uh, was really a sequel to the vast changes which had come about in the outlook of the communities uh, following these uh, the writings uh, and the thinking of the kind generated by Malana Zah. And then again, as soon as uh, the non-cooperation, uh, the uh, internment at Ranchi ends in 1919, and as soon as the non-cooperation proposals come up, <coughs> Molana uh, Azad hits the ground running. And um, he um, is, in fact, he takes up this uh, whole idea of non-cooperation uh, very seriously and in fact becomes the ideologue of the uh, convulsion that is taking place in the country, uh, especially among the Muslims. And uh, in 1919, immediately after his uh, uh, release from the internment, he uh, bursts onto the national stage as it were. And when non-cooperation starts in 1920-21, um, then um, Molana sets up yet another paper, Pegam, a weekly, uh, to convey his ideas. <clears throat> and in December 1921, he is arrested uh, on the eve of the Prince of Wales' visit to Calcutta. Um, he is arrested and charged with sedition for, for two speeches which he had made in Calcutta in July of that year. But now, this is the most interesting thing, that when he is tried in uh, Calcutta, uh, the trial takes place in January, he offers a political statement, a long political statement in Urdu. Uh, I have emailed one English translation of... Uh, a large part of the statement to Saida, uh, Saidaji. Uh, this statement was, I think, published. Um, the translation, not a very um, uh, artful translation. It's a, it, it's a sort of quick translation that was published in 1944 uh, from Lahore. And another uh, translation of other parts of it was published by uh, Yusuf Mehrali in a book called uh, The Price of 
liberty. Now, the interesting thing about this statement is that, um, as Mahatma Gandhi uh, observes, that it is actually political education for the country, because it is addressed not really, although it is nominally addressed to the court, it is actually political education for the country. And I just want to draw your attention to two parts uh, of this statement. One is a critique of the courts. In the um, email that, in the attachment which I have uh, sent to Saida Appa, uh, you will find this at page 43. Uh, I just, it's a, <laughs> I'll read out one page from here roughly. Uh, this is from the Lahore uh, version, uh, uh, the Lahore uh, version which I have emailed you, 1944. Uh, the statement, of course, is made in uh, January, 19, uh, January 1922, roughly 100 years ago. Last month, it would have been 100 years ago uh, since this statement was made in court. It's a critique of this portion which I'm reading out to you is a critique of the courts. History bears witness that whenever the ruling powers took up arms against freedom and justice, the courtrooms were used as most simple and harmless weapon. The jurisdictions of courts is a force that can be utilized both for justice and injustice. In the hands of a just government, it becomes the best means of righteousness, but for the repressive and tyrannical government, no other weapon is more useful for vengeance and injustice than this. It has a contemporary resonance, as uh, you can see. Next to battlefields, courts have played the most prominent part in setting the example of injustice in the history of the world. From the holy founders of religions to the inventors and pioneers of science, there was no holy or righteous organization which was not produced before the courts like criminals. The iniquities of courts of law constitute an endless list and history has not yet finished singing the elegy of such miscarriages of injustice. In that list, we have observed a holy personage like Jesus who had to stand in his time before a foreign court and convicted even as the worst of criminals. We see also in the same list Socrates, who was sentenced to be poisoned for no other crime than that of being the most truthful person of his age. We meet also the name of that great Florentine martyr to truth, the inventor Galileo, who refused to belie his observations and researches, may, merely because their avowal was a crime in the eyes of constituted authority. <coughs> I have called Jesus a man because to my belief, he was a holy person who had brought the heavenly message of love and righteousness, but he was greater even than this in the eyes of millions of people. Consequently, what a wonderful place this convict's dock is where the most righteous as well as the most criminal, criminal people are made to stand. Now, I'll read out another portion or summarize another portion from the uh, text uh, published in uh, Yusuf Merrily's <coughs> Price of <coughs> Liberty. Uh, in this portion, uh, Molana explains the concept of democracy and how it jails with Islam. Uh, and he points out that even if there were an Islamic government, it would not be legitimate even within an Islamic setup if it was not represented. And so he says, he goes on the next step from there to say that therefore a foreign government can be even less rep uh, representative unless it is, unless we are, the true democracy in fact can only emerge when we are free of foreign rule and we are under a completely democratic government. 
so this is what uh, he sets out. I won't read out the whole thing. It's in Yusuf Merrily's <coughs> book, The Price of Liberty, which was published in 1948 from Bombay. Now, <coughs> I just want to read to you what uh, Mahatma Gandhi had to say about, uh, about this speech. He said that, uh, <coughs> Uh, first of all, uh, Gandhi points out that there's a big sea change between the trials and the convictions and the uh, defenses that were offered in the 1919 struggle, where we took up legal defenses and so on, and the ones which we are offering now, when we are boycotting courts. And so he says that without the boycott, we could never have had the Molana statement which in itself constitutes good political education. The Molana statement is hardly meant for the address to the court. It is meant for the public. It is really an oration deserving penal servitude for life. <laughs> and uh, this, by the way, uh, this uh, was followed or rather accompanied by a message from Molana's wife to Gandhiji saying that she would, she would offer to fill the gap left by Molana in Calcutta, in Bengal, as a result of his arrest. And, uh, <clears throat> and she conveys to Gandhiji the message uh, which Molana uh, left for Gandhiji with her at the time of his arrest. He says, kindly add the name of Bengal to that of the Bardoli Taluk. And if any time comes for a settlement, now this is another aspect of the courage of the Molana, that he doesn't wish to seek any uh, indulgence for himself. He says, if any time comes for a settlement, do please not give to our release the importance which is unfortunately being attached to it today. Have the terms of the settlement fixed with the single end in view of our national aspirations, unconcerned with the question of our release. And you know, he was, he was sentenced to rigorous imprisonment. So one year, the charge was sedition. When he comes out of uh, prison uh, <clears throat> in 1923, and I should add that uh, this, this incident of the of Molana's arrest, is followed up with, uh, or rather accompanied with uh, the editorial uh, dated 23rd February, uh, 1922. That is, tomorrow it will be 100 years uh, by Gandhiji in the same issue where all this is mentioned about Molana's arrest, uh, called Shaking the Mains. That's the title of the editorial. And for that, uh, it is that editorial which le leads to Gandhi's arrest again for sedition. Now, by the time Molana is released after serving his sentence, Gandhi is serving his sentence in prison. And uh, by this time, a uh, uh, debate has broken out between those who wish to enter the councils and those who wish to continue the boycott of the councils. Now, again, it is the Molana who at a special session of the AICC in February 1923, actually suggests a compromise between the two groups. Uh, the view that uh, you should enter the councils and the view that you should not. And that compromise is brought about by the Molana who thereby prevents a split in the movement. And that compromise is then uh, that lead which Molana gives to the nation <coughs> is ratified by Gandhiji on his release a year later. So, um, therefore, this role which the Molana is performing of giving a lead to the nation, first to the Muslim community, and then uh, in the manner of, he brings about this, he prevents a split in the Congress in 1923. <coughs> his is that sobering voice 
and he had this knack of finding the formula which would uh, keep people together. So I wanted to mention uh, this fact. And then um, again, that role continues because uh, when there is this debate uh, going on in the country in 1929 about the Nehru Committee Report, the Motilal Nehru Committee Report on the proposals for the Constitution of India, and there is this big campaign being led against the Nehru report uh, in the league. It is at the meeting of a league uh, in March 1929 that uh, again it is Maulana Azad who tries to bring about a compromise uh, between those who uh, oppose the Nehru report and those who don't and uh, suggest certain changes <coughs> to be made uh, so that uh, there could be a consensus uh, around the Nehru report without actually rejecting the report itself. But that was uh, somehow not possible. And uh, that failed. But again, it is the Molana's effort to give a lead uh, sort of direction to the country which could bring about a consensus. <clears throat> and of course, Gandhiji had come to re rely a lot on the Maulana, uh, particularly after uh, Dr. Ansari's death in 1936. Again, when there is a debate in the Congress on the question of uh, uh, the, whether Congress committees are to be allowed in the princely states or not, it is the Maulana who finds the formula which uh, enables both sides of uh, parties who are opposed to it and parties who uh, are in favor of the Congress committees uh, functioning within the princely states in British India. It is Molana who finds the formula, which is that if the committees that have been formed uh, will continue, but uh, they will not take up any action without consultation with the uh, working committee. So uh, again, uh, when there is a debate <clears throat> at the Haripura session in the Congress in 1938 about whether Kisan organizations are to be affiliated uh, formally with the Congress in the sense of giving them representation as Kisan organizations within the AICC. It is again uh, the Molana who finds the proper uh, formula and approach uh, towards that question. So this role of the Molana in um, finding uh, means to uh, give a lead and a direction which, uh, which the country can accept. Uh, this is something quite unique. And then coming to his, um, uh, when uh, partition takes place, uh, that famous speech uh, is of course, I translated it once uh, many, many years ago, the speech which Maulana Azad uh, gives at the Jama Masjid in October 1947 about which it is said that those Muslims who were uh, about to, who had packed to uh, leave for Pakistan, <clears throat> they unpacked uh, and, and stayed on because uh, Maulana uh, emphasized to them that this nation belongs to you. This nation is for you and you are part of it. And its basic decisions are incomplete without your voice. So that uh, wonderful speech, which <coughs> Maulana Azad delivers in October, 1947, <coughs> has that uh, profound effect on people. And th that is why the Maulana <coughs> is so critical to the making of the Indian nation, to the definition of the Indian nation. Well, the Maulana's life and role uh, you cannot really define the Indian nation without uh, the Molan. So, um, <clears throat> and then coming to the more narrower view of education, uh, within the educational um, uh, department, the education ministry, which he headed from 47 to 58, I'd like to say that, uh, of course, we often forget, uh, because uh, there's a lot of, the number of people who, the right to say that this was not done or that was not done and so on. 
<coughs> but they forget that till 1976, education was a state subject. It was not a central subject under the constitution, it, nor was it a concurrent subject as it is now. Uh, it is the, the 42nd amendment, which made it a concurrent subject. So the constitutional powers with which the Maulana was working between 1950 when the constitution came into force and 1958 as minister for education were very limited. And it was the for sheer force of his personality which uh, managed to push a number of decisions through. Now, um, here I'll just give a few examples. There is uh, an excellent compilation of his speeches, which, uh, which I happen to have. Uh, it was published by the Publications Division. It contains his speeches from 1947 to 1955. Now in this, uh, there is a speech which he makes when he goes to Sindhya school uh, at its Diamond Jubilee function um, in February 1949. That is. 26 February, today is 22nd February, so it, it, four days later, uh, the anniversary of the speech would come. Now, why it's important to mention this speech is because here he he's speaking at Sindhya school, which is an elite school like various other public schools, and he tells them plainly that after the 15th of August, 1947, there was no longer any room for schools of an exclusive type. But once their exclusive character was removed, the former chief, school, chief schools and European schools could be fitted into a scheme of national education. Not only so, their special characteristics in developing discipline and corporate life makes such schools more necessary for training the future leaders of independent India. So again, you see the, his skill at uh, bringing about change without actually causing pain. So he's, he says that nature of these schools will change, but the particular kind of skills which these schools teach, they, those will be necessary in independent India to produce our future leaders. And the Ministry of Education have therefore decided, and this is very important, the Ministry of Education have therefore decided to put under their direct supervision both schools like the Chiefs College, College at Ajmer or Raipur and the European schools like those at Lovedale and Sanawar associated with the names of, uh, name of Sir Henry Lawrence. Their exclusive character has been removed and their doors thrown open to all without regard to birth, status, or province. Now, this is at a time when, uh, constitutionally speaking, there is no, um, you know, the powers, are, uh, powers relating to education are with the state. But it's a sheer force the, uh, of his personality that he, uh, that he manages to push these uh, changes through. On uh, the other things have been mentioned, the right to education, size of the <coughs> mentioned. I just want to draw attention to this, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to this address that he delivers at the Central Advisory Board of Education, Katak, on 8th uh, January 1950. This is at Katak the Central Advisory Board of Education, where the program for national education is. He's speaking on the program for national education. And uh, what he mentions here are the four pillars of national education. The first is the provision of basic education on a universal, free and compulsory basis for all our school going children, to all our school going children. It is not limited to 14. So actually, the agenda which he sets out here uh, still remains to be fulfilled to some extent. Uh, 
The next is the provision of adult education in order to wipe out the colossal illiteracy of our masses. The third is the improvement and expansion of technical education in order to solve the problem of manpower for industrial and technical development. And the fourth is the reorganization and improvement of university education from a national point of view. So um, this uh, from a national point of view, but now what we have is a reverse movement where there's an increased privatization and uh, corporati corporatization of uh, the universities. Uh, so one doesn't know uh, how <laughs> you know, he would have looked at this. I'll just conclude then by saying that um, his uh, role in our, uh, his vision throughout is a vision of composite Indian nationalism and his role in the making of um, the Indian nation and in, uh, as a preceptor uh, who guided uh, the country and his own community in a direction that would make this possible cannot be forgotten. Thank you.